Hi, I'm uh, Joshua Fox with Twiggle, and we're a product search company. So whenever you look for products on, uh, you know, eBay, Amazon, and so on, the search doesn't work, and we're going to make it work. So you can find the products you need. A fast-growing startup, and we sponsor the Generalist Engineer Meetup series, uh, including this one. So uh, we're always looking for the best of the best software engineers, and uh, let us know uh, if you're looking. So. Um, couple of uh, facts. We have t-shirts over here and uh, these cool t-shirts, they have a quine on them. So uh, that's what we think is funny. And uh, yeah, we also have a raffle for some great prizes from our sp other sponsors like uh, JetBrains and OzCode. So simply go to that URL, scan it or go to that URL and you can sign up for a raffle. And uh, if you want a shirt and if these run out, then uh, you can also sign up for a shirt. We'll make sure that you get one next time we have a meetup. So I'd like to introduce Dr. Uh, Jonathan Laserson, our speaker for tonight. He graduated with his PhD from Stanford University and has worked at Google. Now he's with the startup Point Grab and he's working in this fascinating field of deep learning. This must be the number one most interesting, hottest field today in the industry. So I'm very pleased to introduce uh, Dr. Jonathan Laserson. Thank you. Thank you. So, thank you for Twiggle for uh, hosting me and for uh, Innovate for uh, giving us the space. And I'll be happy to tell you about deep learning. And uh, so uh, I did my PhD in uh, Stanford University and uh, it was quite amazing to be there between 2006 and 2012 because I, uh, I was in a lab that mostly did computer vision. My advisor was Daphne Kohler, if you, you may know her. She, uh, she, she was uh, a big shot in, uh, in machine learning and then she started Coursera. Um, and uh, I basically got to witness how computer vision changed in front of my eyes while I was there. In my first year, I was working in on this project that had to tell the difference between a giraffe and a lion uh, you know and it was like a big like small images and like the object is in the middle right there and it was really hard to do at the time and then like a year later this was too easy and we went to a, a, a more challenging data set and then like a few years later on we already got sorry a situation where we needed to annotate the entire scene and be able to say this is a dog, this is a person, this is a chair, and this is a chair, and so on. And by the way, I had no idea what I was getting into, so I had no, I didn't know any of the professors in the lab. And like, I basically a few years later, they're, they're kind of like all superstars right now: Andrew Eng, Sebastian Thrun, uh, Daphne, uh, and so on. So we have to remember that. Even though we see uh, this rich picture of a uh, very distinct object, what the computer sees at the beginning of the day is just a matrix of values, you know? And if it's a, a color image, then each entry here would have three values for each one of the colors. And if it's a grayscale image, then only one. And we got to take this information and extract uh, basically the actual object that appear in the image. Now, if you think about it, sorry. <coughs> so, <coughs> I'm gonna. Uh, how how do? You <coughs> sorry, one second. So, how does the computer learn uh, to do this kind of stuff? So, the computer needs data. And in 2009, one of the professors who joined Stanford was Fei Fei Li, and she led this huge collaborative project that's called ImageNet. And in that project, they uh, basically did a collaborative effort to label millions of images so that computer programs would be able to train with them. And then in addition to that, they uh, hosted a competition, an annual competition, where everyone could submit an algorithm to uh, uh, compete uh, in the object recognition task. And what you see here is a graph showing the object classification error rate. And too bad it doesn't go a little bit uh, even further backward, but they only started it, I think, in 2009. And you can see how deep learning changed the game. They, so in 2012, there were maybe in two uh, projects that used deep learning in order to solve this problem. And in 2013, pretty much every project that was submitted to this competition 
used some kind of deep learning algorithms. So uh, I was interested in deep learning. Uh, I was really interested in this area. And what got me interested in this area uh, was actually the human brain. So if you think about it, the human brain can solve vision within 100 milliseconds or so. We are able to tell the difference between dozens, thousands mm -hmm. of classes, even more. So it would be a good time. So I want to go back into understanding how a vision system could solve vision and go back to how the human brain works. And in order to go back to the human brain, <coughs> uh, we have to consider the, visu sorry, the visual cortex, which is this area that, uh, that, uh, that uh, basically takes place here at the back side of the brain. So the information comes from the eyes. You can see it over there. And it goes all the way back through the optic nerve. And it's this weird way in which the, the right eye gives the information to the left hemisphere, and the left, hem uh, left eye gives the information to the right hemisphere. And all the computation, all the uh, processing of uh, the vision information is done in this area of the neocortex, which is most of the neocortex. <coughs> so already there, though, there is some processing that's being done. So some information needs to be uh, there's some, some information bottleneck in what happens in the optic nerve, getting this information back to the visual cortex. And it's a huge mystery, or it was a huge mystery, how did the brain were able to solve this very complicated task called vision within just a fraction of a second. So in order to do that, we need to go back to the two pioneers who led the research on computer vision, on, sorry, on human vision, and those are Hubble and Wiesel. No, they are not uh, cartoonish characters. They are distinguished Nobel laureate. Uh, <laughs> and they did uh, their famous experiment in 1959. What they did is they took a cat and they sat, basically they put that cat in front of a projector, like this projector. So the cat, imagine the cat is sitting over there. And they stuck electrodes to the brain of the cat. And they listened to a particular neuron in an area in the visual cortex. So they were able to listen every time this neuron fires. And they tried to figure out what makes this neuron tick, what makes it excited. <coughs> Sorry. So they put in the projector lots of, <coughs> lots of things that could, they would think would stimulate that neuron, like shining spots and circles and squares and rectangles and different colors and so on. And for weeks, they tried to get this neuron uh, uh, basically fire and failed until, here, let me show you. Let's see if this movie works. Can we turn on the volume? Somehow? Maybe I can do it from. Uh, is there a volume for the, here, let me do it from the, uh, from the laptop. Yeah, maybe the laptop is not in the maximum. So this is the cat. So he's saying that they, when they started, they, they tried all these things and it didn't work out. black spot, white spot, and so on, and so on. And then, suddenly it started to fire. And you can't hear it, but the neuron is ticking right now. And the thing that got it firing is this line over there. Every time this line crossed a certain region of the frame, the neuron fired. So it was a complete mistake, like completely by chance, they figured out what makes this neuron ticks. Right? If, I don't know if you could see it from the back row, but this is basically the edge of the slide that they put into the projector that got the neuron ticks, not the slide content itself. OK? So this was a huge discovery. And what they found out is that that particular neuron was sensitive to a line segment that appears at a particular angle at a particular region of the field of view of the cat. If you move that, if you rotate that line a little bit, that neuron stops firing but the neuron next to it will fire. And if you move that line parallel a little bit, that neuron will stop firing, but the neuron next to it will. And this is how they discovered 
this area that we call V1. And you can think of V1 as this like 3D uh, basically mapping in which one dimension is the angle of the line, which the neuron is sensitive to. Another dimension is the area in space on like the field of view. And there is a third dimension which has only two values, which is whether it comes from the right eye or the left eye. So this is V1. And this is the first layer in the visual cortex. So right after the information gets to the visual cortex, this is basically what the brain sees. It no longer sees these pixels and intensities, values, and so on. It sees basically these features. So why, why these features? Any, any ideas? Why, why lines? What do lines tell us about the world? Why would you think this is a useful information? Because yes? The horizon would be a very significant line. That's true. So like outlines yes. Of boundaries. Edge, detection. Boundaries, yeah, edges. edge detection, right. And we're using edge detectors in our computer vision system, right? So this thing that the brain did, right now we, we understand it. We understand what it's doing. And if we go to this slide, which is like how old school computer vision or computer si uh, machine learning is done, it's basically like this. You take the raw data, and then you think hard and you design features that represent the data better. You throw away the noise and you take the significant part of it and you know, the invariant part of it. Stuff that would be useful for a classifier to tell the difference between the different objects. And when we did old school computer vision, most of the work was done here. This is the part of the, the feature engineering. And the classifier was like, yeah, you could use an SVM, you could use a logistic regression, you could do something like that. But most of the work was done in the feature side. And if you wanted a better feature, a, bit, a better system, build better features, engineer better features. That would be the first thing you could do in order to improve your system. So this, was how, uh, this is how old school machine learning is done and still done in some places today. So <coughs> Olshausen and Field in 1996 were another pair of scientists and they tried to ask the question, why, why these features? Why not other features? I mean, yes, edge detection is important, but maybe there are other ways to represent it. Maybe there are other aspects of vision that are worth representing. So they came up with this experiment. They thought, OK, what, what shaped out the neurons in the brain? What, what did we see in the million years of evolution? We saw lakes, we saw trees, we saw maybe like the skies, we saw some animals. So they took a corpus of natural images and, you know, 1996, so black and white, pretty small, you know, small pictures and so on. So we'll give them some slack. And they took plenty of like small image patches, 24 by 24 image patches out of all these uh, um, natural images. Sorry. <coughs> the goal that this... Um, scientists had in mind was to find basis for them. So a little bit of linear algebra, if you bring you, bring you back to the days of linear algebra. A basis means that every patch needs to be re uh, reconstructed as a linear combination of basis elements. Okay? So for example, this is a patch that is a linear combination of these three basis elements. And what they ask themselves is, if you could choose 64 basis elements, 64 slides, you know, that will be stay fixed during the experiment. So that when I give you a patch from a natural image, you'll be able to reconstruct it as accurately as you can. What would be the best basis elements that you could choose? Okay? And how would they answer that question? They defined an energy function or an optimization goal. And this optimization goal listed right here is basically, they take the real image, they take the best reconstructed image from the basis element, they subtract the two images, and every time a, pen a pixel disagrees between, these two, between the reconstruction and the real image, they get a penalty, okay? And their goal is to minimize the penalty. So if they're perfect, the penalty will be zero. If the reconstructed patch is different than the actual patch, we will have a large penalty. And overall, we need to minimize this penalty. Okay. What's the size of the? Of the base, it depends on how well So they chose 64, well, they did these experiments with various base, base size, and we're gonna look at the, six, the first 64 basis elements. Sorry. And the patches were 24 by 24. <coughs> and, okay, you got, you got this objective function. How do you 
How do you optimize it? What's the first thing that comes to mind? How do you optimize a function? Least square would be some way to, one way to go, yes. It, it's an optimization technique. Here it's a little bit more complicated because you have two sets of variables here. I don't want to go into the detail, but in like a high level way, what another way what's another way to optimize a function? Right, so one way to go is to take the derivative and then update all the parameters so that the derivative is zero. And that would be an extra moon point, either a min minimum or maxim maximum or a saddle point. It turns out that in, in, in a lot of uh, objective functions, there are a lot of saddle points. So it's not, that <coughs> not always that easy, yes? By iteration. So, but what do you mean by iterations? Iteration, iterating what? Putting the, the content and see the difference by getting the system learn the difference. So kind of like that. So we're gonna go to the first, th that's a good idea, and, and we're gonna take the first technical uh, concept of the day which is stochastic gradient descent, uh, okay? So we have, we're talking about, sorry? How did they choose the basis? So they define this objective function, and that objective function is a function of the basis. So all the basis elements, uh, I don't know how to go back from this mouse. You can right-click and choose back from that. Okay, I can open scroll up, right? Yeah. That's true too. So this is the objective function. These WIs represent the content of the bases. But what, is the, what are the bases? The bases, what is, what is it supposed to mean? Yeah. No, no, no. What so is the base? I know. They are not correct. choosing the bases. Wait, they're not choosing the bases. They're letting the algorithm choose the best base so that the best reconstruction of every patch is going to be as close to the truth as uh, possible. But they have to do some assumptions about bases here. You can't say it's something. What do you mean you can't say it's a large something? group of bases, what like the what spotting base? Uh, the base. What is the base? group and you choose the, the one that minimizes the function, right? Yes, a an element of the base is a 24 by 24 patch. And then we are allowed to use 64 elements. That's the size of the base that we're allowed to use. So we need to choose the best 24 by 24 so patches. So it doesn't have to be a geometrical shape, it could be a gradient. Anything, any, any, any picture of 24 by 24. It basically has the same, sh the same uh, shape as the as the actual patches, yes. So when you say base, you mean that it's supposed to be all the normal? Uh, no. Or just uh, samples that are... Yes, I'm not, I'm not enforcing any other constraints. So algorithm also choose a basis and or just, then just weights? It does both. Well, the, the bases are the weights and it also chooses the activation. So there are a lot of parameters here, okay? And the way, uh, the, the first tool that I'm going to introduce on the stage that's going to basically be to play a large role in deep learning is the stochastic gradient descent. So the stochastic gradient descent is like the most general method to optimize a function. What it does, it's, it's, basically, like hill it's basically like hill climbing. So if you imagine the surface of the loss function as like this hill or like a place that has valleys and hills and small bumps and so on, you take the derivative, so it's like a pointer to the top of the hill and you take just one step towards that hill, okay? And you don't do it uh, by reading all the samples at the same time, because that would be <coughs> too large and too, uh, you know, too long a computation. You take a small batch of, sample, let's, of samples, let's say 32 samples, and you compute the gradient. This is the, this is the gradient over there. You take the gradient over these 32 samples, and then you move to the uh, direction, basically you change the parameters of your uh, loss function, which include the basis elements, so that the network, the, sorry, the uh, output on these 32 uh, samples would be slightly better. <coughs> and then you take another bath of 32 uh, samples and you do exactly the same. And you iterate and iterate and iterate and so on. And eventually you converge. And you converge, by the way, to a local or global optimum? Local, local. local optimum. Because when you're at the top of the hill, you're pretty much going to stay there. There's nothing that's going to take you away. So, <coughs> oh, why am I showing that, sorry? So this alpha, a lot of, uh, uh, so if there's anything that we engineer in, uh, one of the things that we engineer in deep learning is how to choose this alpha. Because we can imagine a different, like some people what they do is they say, okay, we should take very large steps at the beginning when we don't know anything. And then as we get closer to the target, we should reduce the length of the step that we're taking with respect to the gradient. 
So they have this schedule where within every iteration you reduce the sidestep a little bit. And there are some more intelligent algorithms that take a look at each individual parameter and they look at the history of how each change in the, you know, in the last, let's say, 200 iterations. And they use that information to decide if we should go with large step on the gradient to this uh, parameter or small step. So there are a lot of gradient descent methods and you can see that they differ. So every one of these balls represents a different way to do, to basically choose that alpha, the, the step of the gradient descent. And you can see that some of them, for example, this is a saddle point. This is a place where all the derivatives are zero, but it's not an optimum. It's not a global optimum and it's not a local optimum. And you can see that some of them basically escape right through and some of them <laughs> stick around for quite, quite some time. And I'm not gonna talk about these methods right now, but this is the kind of stuff that uh, the technical stuff that people develop right now in, uh, in deep learning and shape according to the network's need. So this is what they found out. These are the basis elements that Olshausen and Field found in the experiment, in their experiment. And guess what? This is pretty much exactly what the simple cells, the simple cells is, is, is those neurons that uh, um, that the uh, Hubble and Wiesel found. This is exactly <coughs> what they were looking for. <coughs> so, Olshausen and Field were basically able to mimic, to emulate the process that the brain probably in millions, of uh, millions of years of evolution and some learning maybe that occurs after birth came across to learn the best features they could that represent the data. But this was done automatically. No one told the computer, oh, you should you know, look at the line at the center angle. No, it was automatically uh, done just by optimizing a function. Uh, what's the question of stable? I mean, if, if I just change the uh, sort of several features, the solution was not stable, stable. I can't hear you, sorry? The solution is stable? I mean yes, every time you do this on a set of images, you see this. Yes, not, I mean, maybe not exactly this, but qualitatively, this is what you get when you look at images. This is the first layer of processing in almost every computer vision algorithm that I've seen. The first layer is these little lines in these little angles, in these in this, in this different angles and slightly different places. And now we have a different way to represent the input. We had the original you know, 24 by 24 matrix and now we have this vector that has 64 <coughs> elements and most of them are zeros in this, in this example, and it only has values that correspond to the vector, to the basis elements that were actually used. So it's a different way of representing the input. And basically, we did V1. So we were able to mimic what the brain did in V1, and this is really awesome. So great, we're kind of like closing the gap between uh, computer vision and the, and the human brain, but that's not enough, right? We, we knew how to do this for years, right? We knew how to do edge detectors for a lot of time, and that still didn't let us, you know, uh, recover a thousand different classes within 100 milliseconds. So, the main mystery is, what do the other five layers of the visual cortex do? <coughs> because that was just the first one. Okay, so far so good. So in order to be able to do that, we would, we would want something that is kind of hierarchical. We would want to do the same thing that we did with the features of the first layer. We would want to do it somehow again and again and again and see if we can find something that is like a higher level of representation, a higher level of abstraction. Mm -hmm. And now I'm going to introduce the computational tool that will allow us to do so. And that's very ironically uh, the neuron. So this is the computational neuron. <coughs> So, I'd like to stay in the picture for a second. Computational as opposed to a literature neuron? As opposed to a real neuron, which is here. Up. So, the neuron that we're talking about is this node. <coughs> and that node is making a computation. And the computation, it basically gets input. The input is these x1, x2, and x3. Okay, those are the inputs. Later, I'm going to tell you that those inputs come from different neurons. But right now, let's just say that these are the inputs. And what this neuron is doing is basically taking a linear combination of the inputs, a weighted, you can say it's a weighted average. Every input is weighted by, is multiplied by the weight, which is the edge that connects the input to this neuron. And at the end of the day, we also add a bias. So that's the function that is inside the parentheses. Sigma i, wi, xi plus b. So is that clear so far? 
just basically you can also look at it as a, like a vector, uh, you know, um, a dot product between the vector w and the vector x. And then we add this b. Now on top of this linear combination, we apply a function f. And that function is not linear. And right now, the trending function to use in a neural network is this function. That function is the simplest one anyone could have thought of, I think. Basically, if this linear combination is below 0, you make it 0. <coughs> if it's above 0, don't touch it. Keep it the way it is. And that, that's not in, you know, the, the, like sigmoid is so like 2002. <laughs> it's like, we're now, we're, now, we're now doing this. It works. It's faster. <laughs> it's faster. It doesn't saturate. A sigmoid, which is a, a, a different function that was mentioned, uh, basically returns ba uh, values between 0 and 1. This is kind of like not... Uh, uh, it's also computationally, in, to do a sigmoid, you need to calculate uh, the exponent function, which is more expensive. This, is, this isn't. Uh, some people also do this little line over there so that it doesn't, so if it's zero, so there's still going to be some derivative later on. Uh, but this basically, sigmoids fo fell out of fashion. And these are more often used. So now I'm going to take this neuron and I'm going to put it, oh, right. This is the analogy between the real neuron that gets its input from other neurons. And basically does kind of like this type of computation where some neurons, like, this neuron likes these neurons, and if neuron A fires, then maybe it's very likely that neuron B will fire, but maybe you need other neurons in order to make neuron B fire. So basically, uh, the neuron computes, um, you know what, I I'm not going to go into this, but it's kind of analogous. I don't want to go too deep into the brain uh, uh, organs over there. But now we're going to put these neurons in this graph, and we're going to organize this graph in layer. And the first layer is going to be the input. And every one of these gray nodes is now a neuron. <coughs> and this neuron is connected to the neurons in the previous layers using different sets of weights. OK? And now we can basically make the computation from the bottom to the top. In order to compute the neurons in the second layer, all we need is the neuron in the first layer. And we can compute these neurons. And so on, and so on, and so on, <coughs> until we get the output. And of course, if we have multiple cores, we can do it in parallel. We can compute every layer in parallel and then do it very quickly. So here's a question for you. This is, a new, this is another neural network. The first layer on the left is the input, and this is the output. How many neurons does this network have? Not the input. Four. Six. Six neurons. Six neurons. So if we reduce the, you know, if we deduct the input, the input cells, we have six neurons here. Four in the middle layer and two in the output. How many weights we have? How many different weights total? Eight, 20. 20. To explain the computation? We have um, uh, four weights for each of the three inputs because they're going into four neurons in the middle layer. Mm -hmm. And we have uh, four weights for each of the two outputs because they all do. Right. So we have a weight for each one of these edges, basically. So we have. 12 weights here and eight, uh, eight, sorry, yeah, eight weights over there. And then if we include the biases, how many total parameters we have? 20. Sorry? 26. 26. Excellent. Let's do the same computation here. So here we have two hidden layers. The first layer, the number of edges here is 3 times 4, that's 12. And then the number of weights, the number of edges between these two layers is 4 times 4, that's 16, plus this 1 times 4, total 32. Sorry. And every one of these nine neurons have a bias parameter, so total we have 41 parameters in this network. I'm not using any normalization conditions. So, how would you compute this in Python? if you had to compute what this network is doing. So we already said that y one, one neuron is computing the dot product between the w vector and the x vector, right? And all the neurons in the second layer are basically using the same x. They're basically using a different w, but exactly the same x, the input x is used. So we can stack all the w vectors in a matrix. Each row of the matrix would correspond to the weights going to one of these neurons. And then we can compute all the neurons of the first layer, H1, 
by taking a dot product between the matrix W1 and the vector X. And then we can add B1. And these are all vector uh, operations that can be done in NumPy, in Python, which I assume you are all engineers and you're well familiar with, right? <coughs> you can, I mean, if you're used to, to MATLAB, this is basically the same idea. So this is a very easy mathematical operation that can be done in parallel and you know, all our linear algebra pa packages are really highly optimized to do this kind of computation. And then we apply the function f, you know, element-wise, on these resulting vectors, and then we do it again. So in order to compute h2, given h1, we just make another matrix, w2, and now our input vector becomes h1, our bias vector becomes b2, and we compute h2. And the same thing goes for the output. Questions? Yes? Can you repeat the meaning of the weights? What they're called? The weights, they take different aspects of the input or the whatever, what was represented in the previous layer and they, uh, they, they kind of enhance that partic a particular meaning out of that input. Or decrease. Sorry? Or decrease. Or decrease. Well, it's still a meaning. So th they basically weigh some, you can think of it as a filter over the input. You take one aspect, one feature of the input that you think is interesting and you can compute it using this type of operation. So here's for example, just, just to give you some intuition, when you add more neurons to the network, the neuron can do, the a network can do more computations. And this is some, <coughs> some nice demo that uh, you can see online, uh, where you can see that as you add more neurons, this field that the, new, uh, the neural network is able to, uh, basically the neural network is, is able to better classify the space between the red dots and the green dots. Okay? So more neurons mean more sophisticated, more complex computation that can be done. So what you just showed was that it's easy to compute um, the output from a neural network given that you have all the W's and all the B's and, and all the neurons. Do you mean this? Yeah. Yes. But we're not, okay, so this is not about how to build not yet, but just a just couple of slides right. further. I promise you that you will know how to do it in just a few minutes. <laughs> and yeah, you asked before, what can, what can a neuron do? So, for example, we can show that a neuron can easily uh, emulate each one of the logical units, the basic logical units of computer science. So think about, right now, uh, you know, your largest imaginable uh, computer circuit and it can probably be realized using the weights of a neural network. Okay, so you can think of a neural network as like, like this huge computational circuit that you can tune its parameter based on a, fu uh, on a function that you want to compute. So I'll let you look at this for a second to convince yourself that this is kind of what it's doing and it's gone. <laughs> the deep learning hypothesis. <laughs> uh, so the brain is really not, think w when we're doing perception, we're able to uh, identify objects and, and you know, sounds and faces within 100 milliseconds or so. So I'm giving you now this, uh, the church th hypothesis of uh, deep learning, which is anything that uh, uh, the humans can do in less than a fraction of a second, probably a neural network that has 10 layers or so can do too. And why is this so? Because a neuron in the brain uh, fires maybe a hundred times a second. And if we can solve a task within hundred milliseconds, it means that during the process of this task, uh, the depth of the process is at most 10 stages. Because there's just not enough time for enough neurons to, 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 to basically take, uh, take time in the process. So this gives rise to this hypothesis that we can use basically a layer, a, a, a neural network of, of depth 10 to solve a lot of tasks that we as humans can do in perception. So this doesn't say anything about the size of the layers? No, it doesn't say anything about that. Large, new, large neural network. Okay, and it assumes that, that neurons in, in the analogous, in the, in the brain, are, are working in layers like the model that we saw. Yes. We, we know that? We, is that like there's a, definitely a some... Or do, do we so there's definitely, there are definitely layers in the brain, but there are lots of neurons that break these layers and basically connect within a layer and, you know, to, to different areas of the brain and so on. But they do work in parallel. 
Parallelization is obviously one of the key ingredients <coughs> of the brain, but yes. there are definitely layers in the brain. So there are definitely, definitely areas that you basically you can see activation in this area, and then a few, a few milliseconds later, uh, or maybe tens of milliseconds later, activation in a different area. So the layers also map physically to like areas of the brain? That's yes. Very convenient. Thanks, Nature. Is it <laughs> Sorry? Is it always point one, or did, did you find samples that take less? Does the research find samples that take less? This is, is just, it, this is, is just a... Is it always exhaustive going through all the layers, or there are cases where you have the question, the, the identification much quicker? So, you know, uh, actually, if we want to go, to go into this, because it's really interesting, sometimes we know that you know the answer by uh, listening to your brain before you know the answer. So we, can, we were able to intercept the fact that your vision system was able to know the right answer for a particular question. But you know, your, your conscious self, you know, your motor neurons, the whatever makes your, let's say, your finger press the button that says what the right answer is, mm -hmm. it didn't reach there yet. But if, if you assemble it with a, with a probe, that, that's you what know, I mean. But is it always the same time? You have samples that take much less time to find. Which Are you asking if sometimes it takes less time and sometimes it takes yeah, more time? Because if you yes. have a given amount of layers, you always have to go through all of them, hence you always have to take the same time. It definitely doesn't always ha have to take the same times. Uh, there's some noise in the background and so on, but I don't want to go into this. This is a whole you know, new area which I'm not an expert in. So I'd rather uh, stick to that, but yeah, it's, it's a range, uh, really interesting stuff. So, going forward, we can see that deep neural networks are a very powerful model, and stochastic gradient descent works on them, which makes them learnable models. And that puts them right there, which is <coughs> exactly the sweet spot where we want to have. Because believe me, I worked on very complicated models that are not neural networks that were very hard to optimize. And this is a piece of cake compared to those. So this is just, these lines basically tell you what gradient descent does. We take a batch of samples, then we tune the parameters so the output on these samples is better, then we take the next batch, and so on, and so on, and so on. What does it mean for a model to be learnable in this? Learnable means that you basically can optimize the loss function. Huh. Okay, how is everyone doing so far? Kind of okay? So th because the next thing I wanna <laughs> talk about is how you're able to learn the parameters of a neural network. So, here we go. This is basically a technique. This is, this is basically tells you how to do back, basically how to compute the gradient. So this is the part that I haven't mentioned. So I talked about the learning step. I talked about finding the gradient. But how do you find the gradient? Do you need to you know, do some uh, analytical math formula and so on? So it turns out that there is a very analytical, algorithmic way to compute the gradient of a loss function to every one of the parameters of the network, including the inputs, including everything you put in between. And that way is called back propagation. And in order to demonstrate it, let's look at this function f, which is just a function of three, three uh, parameters, and it does a computation uh, x plus y times z. And what our goal is to take the gradient of f with respect to x, y, and z. Why do we want to take the gradient? Because we want to optimize f because we want to take gradient descent step. How would we do it? So luckily there is this thing in Chad uh, Chad in Infi, in Infi that we learned, it's called the chain rule. And the chain rule, chain rule means that if you can write f as a function of another function and so on, then basically let, let's take for example x, then df to the, okay, sorry, I, I skipped a step. I'm calling this x plus y part, I'm calling it q. So when I did that, f is just q times z, right? And in order to find what's the, what's the derivative of x, all I need to do is do df to the q and dq to the x. So df to the q, this is what f uh, is to q. The df to the q is z. So that's df to the q. And dq to the x is just 1. So the product of these guys is basically... You wrote this q. Hmm? This needs to be the f to the z is q. No, this is true. Is plus y is q. Sorry? It's q. You said one. The f to the z is q and the f to the q is z. That's true, right? Okay. I'm going to now uh, show the exact same thing, but I think in a way that is a little easier to see. So this is a different way to look at the situation. 
we have a computational graph, okay? This is a graph that represents that function over there. These nodes take the plus between x and y. And these nodes take the product between q and z. Okay, we call this node q. This basically exactly corresponds to what I just took there earlier. And now we're going to start by making a forward pass on this graph. Because in order to compute f, we need to go from left to right and compute all the nodes in between. So the first thing I'm doing is I'm going to use this, this q node and I'm going to compute uh, x plus y. And I get 3. But at that moment, I can already compute two other ingredients that are going to be useful later on. I can compute dq to dx and dq to dy. So I'm storing them on the graph for later use. And I'm going to move forward with the computation. So the next thing I need to do is this node. And I'm going to take q and z, and I'm going to multiply them. So we're getting minus 12. And at the same time, I can compute the derivatives, df to dq, which is minus 4, and df to dz, which is uh, 3. Okay, And then for formality, I'm computing df to df, which is 1. <coughs> and now, in order to compute the gradient, in order to apply the chain rule, what I need basically to do is to multiply the values on the path from the root to, the, to each one of the variables. So I'm going to take this one, and I'm going to multiply it by this minus 4, and that's going to give to me df to dq. and also df to dz. And now in order to compute df to, the, to dx, I'm going to take the minus 4 from the right <coughs> and multiply it by 1. And that will give me df to dx and df to dy. And these are the last values that you see here. I'm going to give you another example, just to, to make things clear. Here an, here's another function that I want to take the, the gradient uh, of this function to all its parameters, x, y, z, and w. And now I'm not calling these middle nodes by names anymore. It's not necessary. I'm going to go from left to right. Then I'm going to go back from right to left. So going from left to right, here's what I'm doing. The green is the forward part. The red is what I'm caching for the backward part. So <coughs> minus 4, because the derivative of these nodes with respect to uh, x is this value. And the derivative with respect to y is that value. That's what the multiplication is doing. <coughs> uh, sorry, and the max, what the max is doing. The max takes the, ma the maximal animal and it just transfers it as if it's the identity. So it's basically for the maximum element, this node is like fx equals x. So the derivative here is 1. And for the minimum element, the derivative is 0 <coughs> because it's minimum. You change it, it's not going to affect the actual computation in this, in this node. It's going to stay the same. So that's what max is doing. And now we're going to do the plus. And plus we already know. Plus is derivative 1 to all the edges. So I'm going forward, and I'm caching these values as I'm going along. And now I'm multiplying here by 2. And when we multiply something by 2, the derivative is 2. So I'm writing 2 here. And that's it. We were able to do the forward computation. And now we're going backward. I'm going back from right to left, and I'm multiplying the red values as I'm going left. And now we have the derivatives of f with respect to all the variables. Questions? Yes? What happens if? If z and w are equal? Uh, well, first of all, this is um, a very unlikely event in general. But in that case, yeah, the derivative should be uh, 1 in both cases. But it's an edge case. The answer is we don't really care. It's, a very, it's, it's something that would happen uh, as you're optimizing the function. The chances of it happening is very low. And once it happens, if you make an arbitrary choice, it's gone. So we're no longer in that space. We're talking about uh, finding the derivatives numerically without knowing the, you don't know that the multiplication node is multiplication. Mm -hmm. You don't derive it. No, you, you do. When you have a neural network or any other computational circuit, mm -hmm. you know the computation that it's doing. You just don't know the parameters. You don't know, I mean, the, you, you don't know the values for x, w, y. You know, this w could be, uh, you know, the weights in the matrix, and this x could be the input. So both the, both the weights and the, para and the input variables take part in this graph. So you compute the derivative by applying 
like actually deriving the, the symbolic representation of, of the computation? That's you can do it symbolically, you can do it non-symbolically. Uh, TensorFlow, which is Google's uh, new shiny thing, does it symbolically. TensorFlow allows you to build any arbitrary computational graph, and then it computes the, basically in a process that is very similar to this one, it computes the derivative uh, also in a symbolic way, so you can easily take the derivative. Uh, other ways to do it are not like that. I mean, you could actually do the backpropagation in a non-symbolic way. Just basically compute the, the derivative on the spot every time. Other questions? And this is supposed to be a very big optimization, computationally? You could compile this computational graph once you figure out how to do the derivative and so on, and then you can apply it in parallel on a GPU or a CPU with multi-cores in parallel, you know, yes. And so analysis is way more efficient than doing it numerically instead of symbolically? That's what you're saying? Ah, you mean numerically with respect to actually, uh, yeah, we're not doing, yes, nothing is done numerically. You're only doing numerical gradients to kind of like sanity check that your, uh, your own derivatives don't, uh, uh, are okay. We usually don't do numerical gradients. Uh, if we can do symbolic ones, yes. Like if you can compute it symbolically. It's hard to tell the forest for the trees. I'm, I'm losing you. Um, the size of the network is, should be important. You, you didn't speak about Monte Carlo, choosing the, you know, you're looking for local minima and something, something is missing there. I'm not talking, I'm not doing Monte Carlo, and I, I don't know why you mentioned Monte Carlo. The size of the network is definitely important, but I'm not get, I didn't get there yet. Um, about optimizing the computation. This is just how you compute a gradient. This is a piece of how to do gradient descent in this large computational circuit called neural network. It's, it's a basic thing that we need to do in order to work. And this is how you do it. And, and this can be done, this same process can be done not just on neural network. It can be done in any computational graph that can be written like this. Okay? Um, and you can look, by, by the way, this is really cool because you could look at this computational graph, uh, you know, left to right, but you can also look at this as a computational graph from right to left. Like this max is basically propagating what comes from the, from the right to the maximal element. And this uh, plus thing is, uh, is like a multiplexer in uh, logic design. It takes the input and it multiplies, it duplicates it, you know, fans out to all its, to all its output. So it, it, there is a way to look at this like this as well. So going back to the question that I asked before, we want to do a vision system that is able to tell the difference between a thousand classes of objects within a fraction of a second. <coughs> How does the brain do it? What does the other five layers do? So now we can use the same objective function that Orschhausen and Phil did. They used the neural network and their goal was, okay, neural network, find the best elements that you can in order to reconstruct the original data. And what's the original data in this case? 10 million YouTube videos, okay? It's not all the videos, they took like one frame for each video, which is actually, why, why not more? And they didn't use GPUs, I don't know why, they used a huge cluster. And what they find out is, I mean, yeah, there you go, there's a diagonal line over there. This new one over here is very sensitive to faces. Every time you show it a face, it lights up. This one over here is the cat neuron. So cats are obviously a very strong motif in my talk. And of course, when this, this project reached the New York Times, the headline was, how many computers to identify a cat? 16,000. <laughs> and this is what Jeff Dean, he's like the most senior uh, engineer in Google, said about that. We never told it during the training, this is a cat. Um, it basically invented the concept of a cat. And Andrew Eng from Stanford, who joined Google for, uh, for, uh, with uh, Jeff Dean said, the idea is that instead of having teams of researchers trying to find out how to find edges, you instead throw a ton of data at the algorithm and let the data speak for itself. And this is basically what deep learning is about. We no longer care about the features. We care about the architecture of the network. We use tons of data and we learn the features automatically. All we need is the loss function, and we can build this huge computational graph, and it will figure out the best it can do. What about course of dimensionality and the generalization? Uh, it's like 
It exists. It totally exists. Yes, the the objective functions are non-convex, which means it's it's not it's it's unclear how come we can optimize them so well. And the answer is that the theoreticians they have no idea why it works so well. It just works, and there is a gap right now between the theoreticians understanding why it works and the people who just you know do stuff, do really cool stuff, and the limit is your imagination right now, because the theoreticians are not there yet. What do you mean it's not bridgeable? It's not, uh, the, the, there's no theoretical explanation to uh, how come this works uh, while it increases the number of uh, dimensions that need to uh, Yeah. Happen. According to the theory, these algorithms should go to the first local minimum that they find, <coughs> and there's no reason to assume that that local minimum is going to be a good minimum. And then they're going to be stuck forever. And there are going to be exponentially many local minimums, so the chances of you hitting the right one is zero. But in reality, a lot of these exponential number of minimums are actually working pretty well. So for all, practical pace, uh, uh, you know, for all practical purposes, we don't care that it's not the global minimum because it's fine. And we have all these tricks that we use in order to, you know, that makes it go to a better local minimum, but no one understands exactly why they work and how they work. There is a gap here and people are working on it. But meanwhile, you know, stuff, stuff is working. You would a uh, global minimum uh, produce the picture of the grumpy cat? <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> There's going to be, yeah, tons of cat in the global minimum, one for each, for each type. So you need, so to be lucky. Build the you need what? To be lucky to have the right network that will be created. So it, it just happens that you're lucky more often than you're not. So it, a lot of the local minimums are really good minimums. Sometimes they aren't. Sometimes you get, you get, you get unlucky. But the you're effect of being lucky as we tested, that is to uh, uh, whether a different permutation of uh, random patches, random samples would uh, converge to a different uh, solution, which is good or similar or not good, uh, the different starting points, different initializations, convert to completely different solutions that look completely different with respect to how the parameters look. But qualitatively, the results that they give on the data and the actual optimization of the functions is pretty much on the same ballpark. So eventually, it ends up to, to something that might have something to do with the quality of the data. If you really want to improve the end results, so True. Yes. Yeah. 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 The quality of the data is one of the key elements in order uh, in for the system. That's true. So it's actually a combination of both approaches: the one that you've shown from the start, and the neural network that might produce the best results, perhaps. Uh, on the previous method, the old school computer, vi uh, computer vision, I didn't mention the quality of the data, I mentioned the quality of the <coughs> features. Yes. Um, but with, I see, you can, you can think of like uh, denoising the data as something that a human engineer is doing to the data before. Um, yes, it helps a little bit, but it's not as acute as it was for yeah. old style computer com the machine learning. The network itself, the network when it stabilizes itself does denoising. Oh, sorry. The network itself does some of the design, yes. Point in doing something so here, is, here is what the layers learned when we tried it on faces. It's just a question about the previous one. Yes. Quick question. Um, the previous uh, networks that you showed, yeah, you had some uh, objective function, you had some inputs, like to classify, like with the red and the green dots. Yeah. In the case of the YouTube uh, pictures, what was like the output, the desired output? The desired output was, the, so the information was fed the network all the way to the last layer, yeah. and then going back, you had basically duplication of these, of these uh, things, of these layers all the way back to, the, to, to a vector that is the same size of the input, and your goal was to reconstruct the input. So there was like this information bottleneck over there, where you had to represent the data with less and less neural in every layer, and then go back to uh, the last layer, which would be the same size as the input layer. 
So then you would run and the then hardware, the yeah. Hardware. So and what would be the input in that case? The input is a frame and the output is a frame. The input is a frame that and then the output is the reconstructed frame. And you need to minimize the, the difference. And this is what happens when you do the same thing with faces. The first layer, you know, we know already they find edges. The second layer is part of faces. And the last layer is like this uh, archetypical faces. So how do you get? Sorry, one second. Uh, we got into the, this kind of like, maybe this is like uh, two thirds of the talk. So I'm, I'm going to have a summary. Then we're going to have just a few questions. And then I'm going to have a break of like five minutes or 10 minutes. If people want to go, want to go they can go. And I'm going to continue to give maybe 15 more minutes for the rest of the talk after that. OK? Because uh, here, let me go through the summary. And then, uh, then I'll let you ask a question of Ishai, OK? So here's the summary of what we did so far. First, the visual cortex in the brain solves vision. It's pretty awesome in it. OK? Neural networks are powerful models. If it's differentiable, we can optimize it. And this does not only go to neural networks. This goes to anything differentiable. And it doesn't matter how deep it is. We know, by, we know right now how to optimize very deep things. And we can sort of emulate the visual cortex using a deep neural network. And bye-bye feature engineering. Well, almost bye-bye, not exactly bye-bye. But, but if in the past 80% or 90% of the time we used on finding the best features to, you know, to represent the data, now it's going to maybe 20, 30% of the time. And most of the time is using the model. As someone who uh, was not super experienced with computer vision, you can basically go to the computer vision domain, apply these techniques, and you'll get, you'll get surprising results better than everything you know all these domain experts in vision did for years okay so this is really a democratizing field right now <laughs> and uh, uh, so so this is kind of like the two-thirds point and i'll take some questions right now 